welcome to the Wednesday DC Today. We just now have two days left in the third quarter, two days left in the month of September. And uh, today we got a little whipsaw within the day. Let me just quickly go through the market highlights and lowlights of the day and then talk about a few things. The Dow um, opened up this morning and got up as much as about 150 points. It fell um, 300, almost 300 points from there, and then went up almost 300 points, and it closed down 68. But you had over 400 points of intraday up and down movement, and and so there was a bit of volatility up and down within the day. The S&P closed dead flat, I mean flat, 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 and the Nasdaq closed up 22 basis points. Um, so all of the indices remain down on the month. And the only thing on my screen, now again, I'll give a quarter end more holistic summary of this next week because who knows where things go in the next two days. But right now on the month, you have gold down, you have bonds down, you have global bonds down and uh, tips, inflation protected bonds are down um, tech down, utilities down, and yet um, the dollar, the U.S. dollar is, is what is up on the month. And I don't really see any other asset class of note that, that is up. So uh, not, not a lot of people would have predicted the U.S. dollar being the, the big performer here. I think it's now up a little over 6% since it had kind of hit this little cyclical low back in July. And there's some currencies that it's up you know, almost 10% against in that time period. So um, on the day, though, when I talk about the S&P being kind of flat and, and the Dow barely being down after being up and down hundreds of points, you had energy up 2.5% on the day. And maybe that's not a big surprise when oil was up a massive 3.65%. WTI crude closed well over $93 a barrel, getting close to $94 a barrel. So this is another major story and um, needs to be understood. Now, it's happening at the same time with bond yields. It's happening at the same time with the global bond story that I maintain is one of the bigger stories. I'm going to kind of sum uh, up what all of this means in a moment, but um, the oil story shouldn't be ignored. Utilities, on the other hand, were down 1.9%. So that's, that's a pretty heavy differential in one day between the top and bottom performing sector having four and a half percent separate the best performer from the worst performer is extremely abnormal but that was the kind of day it was the government shutdown i think is coming on sunday the senate um looks like they have a uh, continuing resolution that, to pass but it has it, obviously no no support coming in the house and then the um House might have been able to push forward here a few appropriation bills. They did get a procedural vote to do so, but obviously it's not going anywhere in the Senate and perhaps not even out of the House. And so you have um, a couple of different things being done, but none of which would stop a shutdown per se. It would, might provide, depending on the way certain things go, the political cover that some people have versus others could change, but not the fact that it sure appears the shutdown is inevitable at this point. Um, what else did I want to cover? The, the biggest story I think right now, and I'm trying to figure out the right way to articulate this, but something I spent a lot of time thinking about today, I had read uh, a good little bulletin from Peter Bookvar, who I read every day, and I've read more and more from some kind of longer um, macroeconomist on this theme in the, in, in the last few weeks. The Fed, as you know, did not raise rates last week. And as you know, at their last meeting in July, they did not raise. So you could say, oh, they, they stopped tightening a couple of months ago. And when they look to whether or not they want to continue tightening, they now can do so with every single condition they would look at tighter. But it's tighter without them tightening. And that's really a classic case of the financial markets doing the Fed's job for them. The Fed can say, well, hey, look, we feel we have more work to do. I totally disagree with all of it. But they can say we want to tighten, and yet the 10-year bond yield is up 70 basis points from, from where it was not very long ago. That's a lot of financial tightening. 
and high yield indexes and and basically any reference rate you look at mortgage rates significantly higher so a lot of tightening has happened in the uh, uh, financial markets without the fed doing the tightening that's kind of the issue going on right now is does the fed end up saying okay the markets did our work and and did they even take credit that they kind of prodded the markets in that direction um, I don't, you know, I don't really care about the credit, who tries to take credit for things. My point being, that may be how this is playing out and that there, it is a forward looking deal right now. And then the Fed can say, OK, you know, uh, the work has been done for us. I, I, I would make a prediction about it. I'm just giving you a predicament. Um, you have tightening going on without the Fed having gone tighter. And that's that's the situation. Um, what else? The, there's a Ask David today that's kind of a longer answer, but I would like you to read it at the dctoday.com. Somebody had asked, and they put a lot of thought into their question, you know, isn't it true that we talk about debt, households, companies, and then countries, you know, which is what I talk about a lot, the sovereign excessive indebtedness of not only America, but many um, countries around the world. In the context of that, it's hurting us in the future, and and the person was wondering, well, shouldn't we be looking at what it does in the present? That things aren't, if we can do stuff in the present, why would we think about the future? Does the future even really exist? I don't, I don't really know what that means. And um, are the repercussions, if it's bad, it would be bad in the present, not, not the future. So why are we focus on the future? And there's a lot wrong with the question. Like a lot of the premises are just flat out wrong. I mean, first of all, the future most certainly does exist. If you don't believe so, rewind this tape and then start at the present, and um, you will then find out that the future did indeed exist uh, as the present moves forward. This isn't as tricky and, and clever as people want to make it sound. Here's the deal. Um, the notion that uh, debt is harmless if it can be done in the present just has so many counterfactuals to it that debt can be harmless in the present and not harmless in the future. And stock prices do not get pummeled when there is dangerous debt in the present until they do. And the Lehman and Bear um, stories of, of 2000 and, and Fannie and Freddie and, you know, I can go on and on of 2008 are kind of obvious. But even for a household, uh, debt levels that get higher, but there's still the cash flows. But see, the problem with a plan to service debt is that plans get disrupted by reality, by lost jobs, by declining tax revenue, by uh, uh, inadequate amount of passengers using the MTA or the San Joaquin toll road. The pa debt conditions stay where they are even when revenues to service the debt doesn't. And the unknowability of future revenues is where the risk of the debt is. So I don't think that we're on to something clever to try to think about debt only in the context of the present, not the future. A futuristic understanding of the risk of debt and a futuristic understanding of the known knowns of debt. I will have less resources in the future if I take on debt because there will be resources that will be needed to pay the debt in the future. And it could be worth it and it could not be worth it. But you can't say you will still have the same resources if you will, by definition, have to have less. Unless, of course, what the debt is being used for is to finance a productive activity that grows the revenue on top of the debt. And if someone wants to make the argument that that's what most households are doing or that's what most governments are doing, I would love to see, I would love to see that argument. But uh, the only exception may be where there is a productive use of debt is primarily in the corporate sector, okay? So a few little basic things from yours truly here in the DC Today. I will be in meetings tomorrow afternoon. Brian Seitel will bring you the DC Today for Thursday and I'll be bringing you a Dividend Cafe Friday morning. I do uh, uh, look forward to seeing you the Dividend Cafe. Reach out with any questions as always. Happy debate watching tonight. Take care. Mm -hmm.